everybody. I'm uh, Nikki Kelly and I'm the chair for this uh, two hour session this afternoon uh, and I work for Community Connect. Welcome to the seminar of what matters to you in the end and we're absolutely delighted that you're all able to join us today and to listen and engage as much as possible with all of our amazing speakers. Firstly, from a social prescribing perspective, it's been an absolute honour for me to work with professionals, patients and families through their end of life journey and for families supporting them through the bereavement process beyond that as well and being able to signpost to specialist support and interventions, including setting up the Lost Grief and Beyond cafes with Lolly and Tracy and the team at Cornwall Hospice Care, really starting to reach out into communities so people can walk down the road to have a conversation in their local community about the things that are affecting them and to signpost them to more specialist support. The role of social prescribing, health coaching and many other amazing community roles that are evolving um, as we move forward with the NHS um, and adult social care can play an important role in supporting primary care networks of GP practices and its communities and it is something that can be further developed along with the great resources like the Cornwall Bereavement Network. If anyone would like to find out any more or to connect with social prescribers in their area, please feel free to drop me a note. I'll put my email address in the chat for afterwards. Just a few housekeeping uh, rules for us to get started. Can I ask that all cameras stay off, please, unless you're presenting, as well as microphones. Any comments or questions can go into the chat box. As yesterday, it was a very busy session, so we will try to pick up as many as we can. However, be reassured that anything that's unanswered in the session, we will pick up and share with the presentation and the CPD certificates after the event. By joining the meeting, you have agreed to us recording it and to sharing it. And there is should be a bar that comes up on your screen to show that it's being recorded as it's now begun. There may be some problems with viewing uh, with people viewing pres presenters um, since we are using a meeting mode rather than live event. So a speaker should have the whole of the screen, but you can pin a speaker by hovering over their name at the bottom left and clicking on the three dots. You should have the option to pin and unpin as you would like to. Lolly will be posting a survey monkey in the chat box and ask people to evaluate the seminar afterwards. Please, please um, spend five minutes doing that because we always want to improve what we're doing and to also subject areas that might be of interest. And this would also go out with the post seminar information and recordings. We'd also love to be trending on this important conversation during Dying Matters Week. So please share via your networks and it's hashtag EOL Cornwall. And also for Dying Matters Week, it's hashtag DMAW21. So I'm going to kick off, but you've heard enough from me. I'm handing over to our first speaker, which is Claire Fisher from Dying Well, talking about the patient perspective of completing an advanced care plan. Claire is a public policy professional and associate of the work, sorry, What Work Centre for Wellbeing, who was diagnosed with stage four bowel cancer in 2018. Her project, www.dyingwell.uk, aims to develop and share evidence around wellbeing and terminal illness. Claire is an advocate for early intervention, palliative and hospice care, and has a powerful story of the wellbeing benefits of planning ahead. We're really looking forward to hearing from you, Claire, and handing over to you now. Thank you so much. Really good to be here. I've put all my uh, contact uh, uh, and links and things into the chat, uh, and hopefully you can see the slides as well. So the picture that I use on my first slide is me about 10 days before my diagnosis which came in November 2018. Uh, I am actually teaching. I was very lucky to be doing a teaching uh, tour working with governments uh, in the Caribbean. So uh, I was actually in the Cayman Islands when I first got sick, which is sounds tough, doesn't it? But somebody somebody has to go over and, and that was me. But what happened to me, my, my personal story really briefly, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our project and specifically about the advanced care planning. Um, I I taught perfectly normally on the Monday, we were there for a full week. On the Tuesday, I thought I'd picked up a bit of a tummy bug 
I took the day off, spent the day in my hotel room, convinced I was going to be fine again by Wednesday. By Wednesday, I was really not feeling much better and, and uh, things got pretty bad. And uh, on Wednesday evening, I called an ambulance and ended up in the hospital on Cayman Islands being told I had a complete bowel obstruction and that they couldn't do the surgery on the island and that they wouldn't fly me because I was too sick. So we had a rather dramatic 48 hours uh, when I was on a lot of morphine and a very long story short, I ended up getting medivaced out to Miami, having bowel surgery, waking up, um, having essentially had a tumour removed from my bowel, having had a stoma fitted, came back to the UK and uh, two more major abdominal surgeries and a whole load of chemo later, here I am. <laughs> so I've been living now with stage four uh, bowel cancer for the last mm, 30 months, two and a half years. Um, and as it was mentioned there, my, my background is I'm a public policy um, professional. I do a lot of work with the What Work Centre for Wellbeing. They're all about how do we use evidence to inform national policy. And I got really interested in what does the evidence say about well-being and terminal illness and really quite surprised how little evidence there is and how rare the connections are made between well-being and terminal illness. The mute is on. Yeah, oh, sorry. That's OK. Did you hear any of that? Last sentence, I don't think we heard, Claire. Oh, sorry. I don't know how the mute went on. That wasn't me. OK. It hasn't been on the whole time I've been speaking, has it? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> OK, okay. <laughs> great. Uh, so the What Works Centre um, um, are partnering with me and we're looking at uh, how do we get better wellbeing evidence into national policy around time and little And you can find out more about that on the website. But that's not what I'm talking about today. That's just a little plug. Um, so the things that are important uh, to me, here we go. Um, massive, massive fan of early intervention palliative care and understanding for that label. All my treatment has been palliative. Um, so since the get go, I ticked the box for palliative care, which was pretty scary, to be honest. And initially, I thought I would be dead pretty quickly. I've come to learn that prognosis is an inexact science. <laughs> Um, so I was told I had a less than 50-50 uh, chance of making it for the first year. Uh, I was told um, about a year ago I had less than six months to live and as you can see I'm still looking and feeling <laughs> pretty well and pretty normal so who knows. But it's the referral to the community hospice team, my local hospice is St Catharines, their amazing pain team. Uh, and just generally their support and encouragement that allows me to keep functioning and being well. And I am heartbroken how often I hear people feel they're not ready for hospice intervention or they're not ready for palliative care. I had a friend very recently die before she felt she was ready for palliative care. And I feel that her life would have been a lot better at its end had she had that intervention earlier. I also am a huge fan of the idea that terminally ill people should be allowed and encouraged and supported to keep working as long as they want to, because we know that's massively uh, beneficial for well-being. And hooray for this week. I think we all need to get better about talking about dying. So the story I wanted to tell you specifically today was about my advanced care plan um, and how that came to be. So as soon as I think about planning you can age me I think about the A-team we love it when a plan comes together planning has amazing well-being benefits we know this from a lot of evidence you get a lot of satisfaction from making a plan from feeling like you've taken control and also you get a kind of double benefit because then you know that you've got a plan in place and also when the plan comes to fruition uh, when you see the things you've planned for go the way you plan them again it, it's very kind of comforting and for me the advanced care planning conversation specifically happened when I got my referral to the hospice which was in November 28, uh, November last year. That was two years after I had my stage four diagnosis. So I'm not quite sure why the system took that long to decide that I actually needed a hospice referral uh, and why I'd managed to be through two major surgeries and a lot of chemotherapy before I'd had an advanced care planning conversation. But when it came 
the conversation was a telephone conversation uh, with somebody at the hospice. We had it in several stages, which I found really helpful. So the idea of the conversation was the first thing that I was introduced to. Would you find it helpful to have a conversation? I was sent some information about the kind of questions that we might talk about and the kind of things that I might um, be asked to think about. So I had a bit of time to think about that. And there was a form that I was sent that I was able to fill out myself as well. And then we had another phone call where um, we went through specifically uh, and my, my wishes were recorded. Um, it's all been during COVID, all remote. Uh, so then the hospice team sent out the form that they had completed for me to check that they'd captured everything that they'd said properly. And I have a, probably about every couple of weeks, I have a, a kind of check in with the hospice team. Uh, and I know that at any point, if there's anything else I've thought of or anything I want to change, I can kind of do it. So a few things that I have found really important, uh, something I've learned about through doing it, um, so my patient perspective. Um, I know we're talking about what matters most. I am not great at medical information. I'm not a terribly medical type of person. I really struggled with the idea that my advanced care plan would have to be very specific about medical things that I didn't really want to think about. But what I found really lovely was actually the conversation was as much about what matters to me. You know, the fact that I want to be able to see the outside and ideally go into the outside, that I'd like to be at home, the kind of music that I'd like to listen to, the kind of things that I want to be able to see um, from my bed. And the idea that quality of life and being me to me is much more important than extending my life um, and I want for my children I have three school age children I want for my children to see me as me for as long as possible and hopefully minimize the bit where I'm looking very sick and the medical team at St Catharines were able to sort of translate that idea into some very specific things and talk to me about what kind of medical interventions that might mean. So I didn't have to be an expert in the medical stuff to fill in the form. I was just allowed to talk about what mattered to me. I have heard many sad stories about people who can't talk to their family or who have different opinions from their family about what matters to them at the end of life. I'm very fortunate. My family are very open. We talk about this together. And for us, it's been a family affair, talking all the way through about my illness and how we manage it. And similarly, with my advanced care plan, whether um, they want me to die at home or whether they would prefer for me to die somewhere else and whether they want to look after me and so on. Um, my hospice has produced a little video, so although we can't visit, we have watched the video as a family and agreed that it looks like a lovely place and that we're really pleased that it's there. Um, and I've always been really surprised by the kind of questions that children ask. So my son's question when I uh, when we're having the conversation about whether they thought I should die at home or at this hospice, my son, who's 15, said, if you die at home, would we have to carry you down the stairs? That was obviously his <laughs> uh, major concern. Uh, so we, we said, no, <laughs> don't worry, you're not going to have to carry me down the stairs after I die. And I'm always surprised when I talk to my children about the kind of questions that they ask and the things that worry them. And we find that by talking about these things, you can then move on from them and then you can kind of get back to normal life pretty quickly. I think often advanced care planning is presented as a form that has to be filled in. And goodness, as a patient, you have a lot of forms that have to be filled in and consented to and signed and filed and paper. And really it's not. I think, I think it's a conversation. It's a conversation that goes on within a family and with a care team. And again, for me, that's why the hospice involvement has been so important because they feel like a really a good continuity of care, let's say. Whereas frankly, every time I go for chemo, there's a different nurse. I don't think I've met the person who is my GP in person, but with the hospice, I feel like I've got a, a continuity of care and I've had a conversation and I feel like those conversations are being recorded and when the time comes the people who know me best will have the opportunity to look after me. And I know that for patients and for medical professionals sometimes this is a, a thing that we skip round a little bit but actually for us I would say that having this kind of practical conversation facing the reality of what's to come can I fit a hospital bed in my bedroom and if I did where would my husband sleep all these kind of very logistical practical conversations for me anyway 
And rather than being scary, they've been quite liberating and quite reassuring because I think I've had some very traumatic experiences in hospital and I was quite worried to be honest that dying would feel like a traumatic event in a hospital and the planning process for me has helped me realise that it doesn't have to be that way and it's unlikely to be that way and we've put as many plans in place as possible to uh, prevent that happening and so my challenge really I suppose my well-being challenge is rather than feeling like we're planning for death as a dark and horrible thing to do with advanced care planning. My personal experience and my kind of working theory is what would it look like if we reframed advanced care planning as a well-being intervention, as an opportunity to really get to know patients better, to understand what matters for them most, as an opportunity to reassure them and put things in place. For me, it's been um, for my family, it's been a hugely, hugely positive experience. And so I hope that thinking about it in that way might help other patients feel less frightened about it and maybe medical professions a little bit more confident about beginning those conversations. So um, I have put a link also to the What Works Centre for Wellbeing, who are helping me kind of with a national project on this. Um, so before I finish, and I'm really happy to take questions, just a quick plug. If you are a medical professional and you want to get involved in the What Works Centre Dying Well Network, there's a link in the chat that I've posted already. And you can find all the information there and you can sign up to their work as well. But for now, that's me and I'm really happy to take questions. So I'll turn that off over to you guys. Oh, thank you so much, Claire, it's, uh, to, to, um, for sharing your journey. And I think there is nothing more powerful than people being champions and you know, sharing their experiences to be able to change that for other people and to open up that conversation. In fact, in Cornwall, there is a patient champions programme happening at the moment. If you don't know about it, it would be lovely to link you into it because um, they're trying that kind of, you know, change from a patient's perspective to help us all as professionals and within our own personal and our families is so important. Um, and I think too, what you've spoken about, about a normal life for as long as possible and it being a well-being intervention is just so powerful because when it's not there, as you said and highlighted, those very small details that are so important um, can cause so much distress when they're not talked about uh, and also that kind of reassurance for everybody. One one question to start off and um, I'll go into the chat then for everybody else is what how have you found you talked about continuity what about changes and how do you manage that perhaps as you talk a bit about your family perhaps they become more confident as they get older and they want to take on more of a role or you have changes that you want to make how often do those conversations then happen um, in terms of updating your advanced care plan okay well i suppose we only made it in november which I mean, goodness, it's nearly six months. It doesn't feel that long. Um, so I don't know that we have a formal timetable, mm. particularly um, mm. to, sorry, to kill my phone. Um, we don't really have a formal timetable, but I am in regular contact with the hospice because um, I'm under their pain management team. So we have at least once a month, we have a telephone cons consultation just to check my meds. And one of the lovely things about the, the hospice conversations is they're so holistic. So, you know, unlike, frankly, every other medical conversation that I ever have, I know that if I've thought of a thing or there's something worrying me that's not directly related to my medicine, I can always talk about it at those uh, times. So formally, I've only added one thing, which was um, about my glasses. I was, <laughs> I was remembering when I woke up from one of my surgeries, one of the things that made a real difference from Miami to the UK was that the UK, they talked to me about what do you want us to do when you wake up to help you know where you are. And one of the things they did was they put my glasses on me when I was still asleep. So when I woke up, whereas in Miami, I couldn't see when I came around. And again, I was just remembering that and, and really worried that I needed to tell the hospice that I need to have my glasses on. And if somebody's in the room or if somebody's talking to me, even if I don't look very awake, make sure I've got my glasses on. But it's those kind of things and it? those little details that really matter that you feel reassured about. Oh, they know that now. That, that's fine. Thank you. And just some of the comments from in the, in the chat and the questions. Um, Rachel says, I wanted to say living well until death is so very important and also part of the advanced care planning stage and agree yeah. with everything that you have said, Claire. 
Um, Sue has said, what an inspiration. Um, and so many people say thank you for sharing your story. Um, I'm just coming, there's so many comments, so please bear with me. Peter, <laughs> and, um, I was just going to um, ask as well, what do you also feel, Claire, is um, having also supported people going through in their journey in the community? People talk about a lot of medical terminology suddenly coming into their life and lots of different professionals with lots of different roles and specialisms and so do you think the continuity in that contact monthly with the your advanced care planning helps to just put all of that jigsaw puzzle together because you hear people being quite overwhelmed mm -hmm. um, as that kind of journey evolves and perhaps things get more complex so it'd be great to get your perspective on that. Yeah, for sure. And I think re it's really reassuring as well. So, you know, the oncology team are amazing, but they're only really interested in you while you're on active chemotherapy. Um, and so when there's gaps and you, you're not sure about your cancer, generally, you're not quite sure who to talk to. And also, I'm very aware that, you know, I don't want to be one of the people that has chemotherapy right up until the end. Yeah. Um, frankly I've, I've seen some people and it sounds really judgmental but I sit in a chemo ward and I look at some people and I think if I was as sick as you I'd just want to be sitting in my garden I wouldn't want to be <laughs> on this chemo ward so I think from from again from from seeing some friends walk through this I think it can feel scary to say no to chemo because you're saying no to the support of the oncology team who are lovely so for me having another team that I know are going to still be there is really reassuring and yeah I haven't had a, the best experience with my GP no fault of theirs just lots of changes and we've never really met um, so yeah it's hugely reassuring to know where you're going to be potentially and and who you're who's going to give that support it's yeah it's really reassuring um, on medical terminology I, I don't know. I, I I tend not to get too involved in the medical terminology. Yeah. And those patients really learn to obsess, and I learned early on don't don't Google anything ever. It doesn't, doesn't yeah. make anything better. <laughs> yeah, there's um, another just question there. Well, uh, more of a statement, but I think it's a good thing to raise. Sue was just said it's got to be got to be better to ask than to ask, ask than not, as the answer it's might not be what you're, you're expecting. expecting. And I guess that's all part of confidence, isn't it? In better informed conversations as well around well-being. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, my I, I found that doctors don't speak very directly. You know, nobody tells you you're dying. So, you know, somebody else has said, at what point does it become palliative? Literally the first time I encountered the NHS, you know, so I kind of hit the ground running. I came off a plane in Miami. And, you know, the first consent form that I had uh, for chemotherapy there was a list of options and they'd already ticked palliative on my consent form nobody discussed what that meant particularly and I noticed on my most recent chemo when I had to sign my consent form they have now they've got some little explanations in brackets which are much better you know so after palliative it says we're not expecting a cure but we are expecting to give you a better quality of life and that feels a bit more reassuring but yeah, literally, I, you know, I went within a month from not knowing I was sick to having bowel surgery to hit in the UK and being presented with a consent form for chemo that just said this is palliative. Yeah. And, and yeah, yes, that was the thing I googled. I googled life expectancy of people diagnosed with stage four bowel cancer. And that, that was probably the last thing I googled, to be honest. Um, yeah. Because I said to the I said to my oncologist, you know, the stats are less than 50% chance of making a year. And he said, yeah, that sounds about right you know, we'll do what we can. And you think, oh, yeah, <laughs> OK. <laughs> but they don't, you know, they don't specifically say. My oncologist talks about kicking the can down the road. That's what he says. Shall we have another go when we have more chemo? How are you feeling? Do you want to have another go at kicking the can down the road? Like, yeah, go on then. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Catherine has just put in the chat, my friend felt bereft when discharged mm -hmm. from oncology. Uh, and felt abandoned how do you think we can as professionals make this transition better I mean again I don't know the ins and outs of the NHS system but I I feel sad that it has to be either or that you know for me I feel really fortunate that I've had this referral to the hospice and it was a thing that was done because I was in a lot of pain I was in a lot of pain you know I've got 
I've got bowel cancer, it's metastasized, so it's in a pelvic cavity, which is basically all the space that's left after all the surgery I've had is where my cancer now is. My GP was prescribing me codeine in ever increasing doses. They said that was about, you know, I can give you more codeine. The chemo team said, oh, the chemo will help with the symptoms. And I was saying, but I'm still in pain. Um, and, and they said to me, well, I suppose, you know, if you want, we could refer you to the hospice, like it was a real last ditch attempt. And I was so desperate. I said, yes, you know, refer me to anybody you think could help. That would be brilliant. But And they have, and they're amazing. And I'm not in any pain anymore because they're magic and I love them. Um, but that means I am now under the hospice team at the same time as having active chemotherapy, at the same time as working. And I realise that's quite an unusual position to be in. And I feel very, very fortunate to have ended up here. But I think that should be more normal. You know, for people who want a palliative path pathway, we should be looking at what does that actually mean? What, what kind of continuity of care are you putting in place where they see themselves uh, being properly supported for as long as they need? Yeah, and um, Claire has just asked as well, has emotional and mental health support formed part of the care planning process? Um, <laughs> there, there is a charity at the hospital where I have my treatment. Um, um, my youngest daughter has had counselling there, which has been really, really good. And there is the offer of family counselling. We haven't taken that up. Um, we are part of a church and so we feel very well supported by our church and um my my husband was in the fire service and both his sisters are nurses so there's kind of a tell it like it is kind of family attitude so we're we're, we're fairly good i suppose at talking honestly to each other in the family um but it's not a regular thing that i get asked let's put it that way i'm okay and i'm pleased that i have the support but it's not a thing I get often as oft asked about as often as you think you should, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> given yeah. what I'm living with. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting when um, with Lolly and the team at the hospice creating the Lost Grief and Beyond cafes, that uh, experience you're describing and the people have talked about in the chat around wellbeing conversations is a big part of what people talk about in the group and want to support kind of how you have those conversations in local communities and and if you need it you can go off to a private room and have more of a chat mm -hmm. but it's about that support so that it's really interesting to hear you say that and sue has just put make you know make memories but accept that the person on the journey might get tired and then not able to continue as before so i guess that's about everyone understanding where someone is on their journey um and then i just so want to think talking to your family as well you know yeah <laughs> something popped up and i know a lot of patients do it a lot of families found it helpful you know write birthday cards for future birthdays i've got twins who are 15 and one of them said oh god mum you haven't done that for us have you and i said <laughs> that would be really creepy like every birthday I'd have to remember that you died and I was like oh okay well I haven't even thought about it but it's good to know that you don't want me to do that and so we you know we do have the conversation about well what what do you want me to do what would you find helpful yeah. um but I, I think it's very easy to kind of go down a route of things that you think people want and then realize that that's not going to be helpful for them so no Thank you. And Karen is just put, I think there is often fear of asking questions because people might be frightened of the answers, but knowing what is happening yeah. and what the future holds can actually be empowering because it gives people the opportunity to talk openly with their loved ones um, and to make plans, which again, very much is what you're saying, isn't it, about well-being and, you know, seeing this as part of well-being and building resilience, really, as well around for the people around you. And I think when you know you're living with a terminal diagnosis, what you imagine is always going to be worse than, you know, you've already imagined the worst thing 10 times over. So whatever somebody says to you isn't going to be that bad, you know. So for me, I've had, particularly in America, I had some horribly, horribly traumatic hospital experiences, as you can imagine, being admitted as an emergency um, bowel obstruction case, <laughs> being flown about the place on morphine. And I think in my head, I thought that that was what death was going to look like for me again. And so 
you know, I asked the question and, and St. Catherine's have been brilliant, you know, to help me. How do you actually die of cancer? What does it actually look like? And I know you, you probably all read the books by Dr. Catherine Mannix and, you know, other similar things. But to really engage with the idea of what does it what does a normal death look like with cancer actually is so far removed from the horror story of nightmare trauma that I've already imagined for myself. Having those conversations are reassuring and um, they're not they don't make it worse. They make it feel a lot easier to manage, to be honest. Thank you. Well, we've actually come, I'm sure we could all listen and talk with you all afternoon. I mean, what a fantastic um, presentation and there's lots of people putting that in the chat, which I'm sure you'll be able to read when you can sit back in a minute and hand over to somebody else. Um, but thank you so much for sharing your journey. Um, and if there is anything that you would like to link into, we can also it'd be great to kind of see if there's some other platforms we could link your work into as well that you're doing nationally. Um, I can think of a few things already, so I'll definitely be dropping you a line. Right. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. I will be hanging around to, to see the others, and I know you've got Q&A at the end, but thank you so much. Thank you ever so much, Claire. Uh, thank you. So now we're going to be hearing about enabling choices in challenging circumstances from Sam Facey. Sam is part of the palliative care nurse team who worked for the Cornwall drug and alcohol team as a home detox nurse. Currently, she's working as improving access coordinator for St Austell Healthcare Hub, a collaboration of St Austell GP practices to form one primary <laughs> care network with Mount Edgecombe Hospice. Uh, I know Snorstall really well, fantastic team of people up there. Um, their aim is to improve access into palliative care for homeless people with complex needs. And this project has been running since September 2020. So over to you, Sam. Hello, thank you. Um, thank you to Claire, what an, an inspiring talk. And um, just off the back of that, I have to say that um, when having these difficult conversations, um, people seem to respond more when you're talking about it from the context of living well rather than let's talk about your death so um that was a really a really amazing um speech so thank you um so could i have our first slide please one thing i'd like to mention is that we're the collaboration is between uh Mount Edgecombe hospice harbour housing and st austell health hub um, Harbour Housing have around 80 beds locally around St Austell for homely, homeless people. So actually we do have the largest conurbation of um, homeless people in Cornwall. So it's quite a good place to start really. Um, the project's funded for a year back in September following um, a conference um, initiated by uh, Carolyn Campbell and colleagues. And, and they discovered this this quite big need really um, so when we think about homelessness um, what do we think about a home um, crisis describe a home as providing roots identity a sense of belonging and a place of emotional well-being and homelessness is about the loss of all of those things uh, could i get the next slide please Um, what do we mean by homeless people? Um, we do automatically think about the rough sleepers, um, but there's also a whole heap uh, more people that are included in homelessness. That's people who are insecurely housed, people staying in hostels, um, people living in squats, people who are surface, sofa surfing and anyone in temporary accommodation. Um, people officially recorded um, as sleeping on the streets rose massively from 2010 to 2017 following um, austerity really to 168% increase. Um, January, the figures from the National Audit Office for January 21, there's more than 33,000 homeless people. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg really because they're the people that we've got we've got on waiting lists for housing and things like that. So it does include um, more people than just people you tend to think about uh, sleeping up on the streets. Could I get the next slide, please? So underlying causes of homelessness, this is like a massive area. Um, welfare benefits have an impact and any cuts to welfare. Um, 
policies, government policies, so uh, the policy about uh, not having more rooms, things like that. Housing supply and affordability, that's a massive issue nationally, particularly in Cornwall, because as housing prices go up, it has a knock-on effect all the way down, all the way down the stream, if you like, so that um, a single but single apartments or flats um, become so much more expensive. Um, poverty um, is a big cause of homelessness. Um, apparently, we're all one or two paychecks away from that, as is unemployment. And then there's um, individual issues. Um, a lot of people that find themselves um, living on the streets or homeless or in hostels do have complex trauma. Um, a whole other subject is trauma-informed care. Go look it up, it's really interesting and that enables us to have a really compassionate approach to people. Um, people have had difficult childhoods, people have what's called trimorbidities and that's where they have mental health problems, drug and alcohol problems and complex physical problems, uh, financial difficulties difficulties, immigration, uh, criminal justice, uh, relationship breakdown. Uh, we see a lot of we see a lot of people that have been through the care system and um, break down family relationships. Uh, so that's just some of the causes, but obviously, um, you know, that everybody's got their own story. Can I get next slide, please? So. Uh, what do we know about dying as a homeless person? Um, we know um, they're three, more, three times more likely to need an inpatient admission. They're twice as more likely to die of cancer. They're seven times more likely to die of alcohol-related causes. And they're seven times more likely to die of HIV or hepatitis. And that's um, evidence from crisis. Could we get the next slide, please? So this is quite shocking, really. Um, it really shocked me when I first came across this, that the average age of death is 47 for men and 43 for women, um, which is 30 years difference from people that are housed. It's huge. It's massively significant. Um, so we're actually um, needing to kind of have conversations with people that are actually quite young, and that that can be hard for everybody, really. Um, crisis report found that deaths are often sudden, untimely, undignified, with access to palliative care being very unusual. So um, within the hostel situation, very unusual for them to have a, what we would call an expected death. Most of their deaths are unexpected, so so therefore they're more traumatic, the police come. Um, it is, people are often just found dead in their rooms. Um, it can have a big impact on the support workers in the hostel and also the other residents that have to witness such traumatic death. And it can have long lasting impacts on families, friends and workers. Can I get the next slide, please? So if we look at cause of death um, within the organ failure um, chart, a lot of that is down to liver disease. Uh, so we're looking at um, generally problems related to alcohol use. Um, so we talk about disease trajectories and we'll look at a slide in a minute with a organ failure trajectory. Um, but it's much more unpredictable, which can make it harder to plan. Um, people tend to be very up and down and they can have periods where they're fairly well. Um, and how the trajectory goes with their disease will depend on um, what they're using, if they're using. So um, it can just make things harder to predict really and plan. Could I get the next slide, please? So choice as far as dying as a homeless person goes um, 
is quite limited really because um, most of us would be able to go into a nursing home if we needed it or a hospice if we had a bed. Um, but there's lots of barriers to that for homeless people. For instance, um, a lot of homes in Cornwall um, are age restrictive, so you can only get a bed if you're over 60 or 55. We've got one or two homes for younger people in Cornwall, but I think the youngest age limit is, a, well, I I'm not sure about that, I won't say anything about that. Um, homeless people have complex needs. Um, it's really common for them to have drug and alcohol um, problems and that can be really difficult to accommodate in a nursing home and in a hospice. So you can see that choices are quite limited. Um, there isn't really any hospices for people um, with those sort of complex needs specifically. There is one hospice in Toronto um, that where there is four beds for homeless people. Having said that, Harbour Housing are really, really innovative and are hoping to have one or two end-of-life beds um, at Cosgon Hall, which would be really lovely. They happen to overlook the farm, but they're not, they're not in place yet. So, so many people with very complex needs at risk of dying are in hostels or temporary accommodation with inadequate support or care. Can we get the next slide, please? So barriers to advanced care planning. Um, people that work in hostels, support workers, um, are support workers. So they're not carers. They're not necessarily people that have had training in how to have difficult conversations. Um, and there can be a lack of confidence to have difficult conversations. Um, there can be denial from the residents and from um, the staff. There can be concern about fragility and removing hope that's quite a common one really um, if we have these conversations and talk about death or dying um, are we removing hope and increasing people's chaotic drug and alcohol behavior there's that uncertainty about prognosis that we spoke about and then we've got the lack of options to offer people can i get the next oh before we get, um, this is all research by Dr. Sorry, thank you, Dr. Caroline Shulman, who is amazing for homeless palliative care and has been the lead on all this research up until the last few years. There was no research really about um, end of life care for people with complex needs. So, so now it is getting more of a focus. Can I get the next slide, please? So is it appropriate for a homeless person to die in their hostel? Um, hostels do tend to have a focus on recovery. Um, they are temporary accommodation. Um, Cosgarn Hall in St Austell um, is, is a wet house. So people um, are housed there who are still using drugs and alcohol. So it, it can be quite a chaotic environment. Um, Hostel staff are support workers, um, so they're not trained in personal care. Hostels aren't CQC registered, so they're not there to provide that sort of personal care. Um, storing and administering medication is not something that can be done in a hostel. Um, they don't do the domestic sort of care either, so um, Although Cosgown does have cleaners, they don't necessarily go into people's rooms to clean up. Um, the staff ratios are quite low compared with a, a nursing home or a hospice or a hospital. And um, there will tend to be security on overnight, for instance, or very minimal staff. Um, there can be difficulty accessing social services and palliative care just because um, support workers don't necessarily know the pathways um, and it can be different depending on what area they're in. Uh, we spoke about the hostel environment being chaotic. There can be safeguarding concerns, particularly um, when you have syringe drivers with minimal protection from other residents. Um, Deaths have a massive impact on staff and other residents. At Cosgarn, um, 
we had a few deaths in the run up before Christmas and, and it was really traumatic. I think the nature of residential work, you get really close to your residents. Um, so so when, when they die often, suddenly, traumatically, um, by suicide overdose, it, it can be really hard to, to manage. And it has a big impact on the support workers. I have to say, I've been really in awe of the work they do at Harbour Housing. Um, and it really is something we should be really proud of in St Austell. Um, next slide, please. So, uh, residents who live in the hostel will see the hostels as their home. Um, average length of stay is about two years, but they can be there a lot longer if no move on accommodation is found. So it is very much their home. The other residents and the support workers have very much become part of, of their family, if you like. Um, so it's perfectly natural, like for the rest of us, someone would want to die in their home, which happens to be a hostel. Um, a couple of quotes from people. It was his desire to remain here. He wanted to remain here. For me personally, I don't think we should go against that. Um, I've had it when people end up in hospital and you know that's the last place they want to be. Could I get the next slide, please? Um, so there are challenges faced and no one agency can look after all of the needs um, of complex people. It is very much about teamwork. Um, you can see some of the challenges faced. We spoke about them, the uncertainty of disease trajectories, concerns about removing hope, confidence, Quite often people will have um, difficult family um, relationships, issues of medical medicine management and dying in a hostel. Could I get the next slide, please? Um, it's just a slide about the difficulty of communication and, and that can go for anybody. It's hard enough having these conversations with, with people that don't have these, these significant difficulties um, so so it's acknowledging that they are difficult conversations but as Claire has said in the previous talk it can have real benefits for for the patient themselves could I get the next slide please um, this is an example of organ failure trajectory you can see it's quite unpredictable um, and we're talking about really young people as well quite often in their 20s and 30s so it can be a lot harder to kind of get your head around the fact that they are as ill as they are because they tend to look better than they actually are. Uh, could I get the next slide, please? And if you can't predict, how do you plan? So we use something called parallel planning. Could I get the next? It's a shift in focus where we hope for the best and plan for the worst. Um, if, some, if we put um, plans in place and, and somebody stops drinking and we don't need those plans, that's absolutely fine, that's great. But it's better to have things in place. Um, since this project has been up and running, we have had the first expected death in Harbour Housing. And it was a really lovely death and I, I, I would hope there have been some healing for the residents and staff, really. Um, that, that death can be okay. It took a lot of teamwork, district nurses, um, Wendy Rowe, palliative care nurse, myself, support workers particularly. Um, we couldn't get a care package because the care agencies didn't want to go into the hostel, so Home First stood up to that. We are looking at developing links with care agencies and offering them training, so hopefully that, that will change. Um, this project's funding will run out in September. Hopefully there'll be some way of keeping the service going um, because there is a huge gap. Have I got another slide? If you have any questions, by all means, email me. To be honest with you, I could probably talk about this subject for a whole week. So to put it all into 10 minutes has been a challenge. 
Um, but please email me or ring me um, if you need any help or, or advice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. I mean, people are commenting, you know, thank you, um, Vicky has said, for opening her eyes. And uh, Andrea said, chaotic is the enemy of good palliative care. And this, is, this presentation has made me think and interested in the parallel planning. So I think definitely going to have some questions and more conversations coming your way, Sam. Um, I was also just wondering, as you were talking about the training, how important this is about linking in with the end of life care passport and how you kind of have that kind of shared understanding of people's journeys. Um, and I was also just going to quickly say before, I, I mean, I'm sorry we we're short on time, is just I was fortunate enough to spend a long time with the Pathway for Homeless Health up in London. And oh, they do know, yeah, their patient um, coordinator across all areas of the hospital and follow people back. I don't know yeah. if they built their sanctuaries yet, but I know they were going to. Yeah. Um, but fun, uh, those kinds of um, practice so are amazing to see as all the work that you're doing. And also like having I've had the opportunity from agencies to go and stay in some of the hostels. Mm. And I think um, sometimes it's opening the doors a little bit, isn't it, in a way that protects people and Definitely. their identity, but just to break down some of those barriers so that people Absolutely. can understand what happens. Um, so I, on a personal level, I'd love to hear more, but I can see um, just uh, wanted to pick one more up for you before we go. And Freddie has shared that he discovered quite recently his missing brother had died a sudden accident in a Salvation Army hospital and I only met the hostel staff at his funeral. They were so compassionate and had become his family and along with res along with resident regular residents, I've often wondered how we could better support those amazing workers. They're phenomenal, so inspiring to hear the projects like this. We've much to do. Thank you, Sam. Yeah which uh, I guess, you know, just to you for a quick comment, because I guess I would absolutely echo, Freddie, from all my experience working with people who are homeless and all the support workers, everyone puts in so much energy and effort, don't they? But it'd be great to get your thoughts, Sam. To be honest with you, I've been in awe of what the support workers do. They're palliative care nurses, they're community, but they're not. But they, they advocate for their residents and, and they know them so well. So they're the people that can protect deterioration. So it is about teamwork. And, and yeah, I've just been so in awe of the work they do. I couldn't even begin to put it into words, really. Um, yeah, um, Harbour Housing were amazing. Well, listen, the work you're doing is absolutely fantastic. And thank you so much for sharing it with us this thank afternoon. You. I'm sure you're going to get lots of questions coming your <coughs> way. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank, really thank you ever so much. Thank you. And now we're going to hear um, from the Cornwall Hospice Care Therapy Team, What Matters on Discharge. So the hospital therapy team strives to take a person-centred approach to the discharge needs of those going home from the hospice. Occupational therapists Chloe and Emma explain how they make what matters most to patients their top priority. Over to you. Hello. Um, so me and Emma both work at um, Mount Edgecombe and St Julia's Hospice. Uh, so we're going to be talking to you about what matters to you on discharge from um, an occupational therapy point of view. Um, First slide, please. So definition of occupational therapy, end of life, is that we offer a distinct contribution to the care of those who are dying and their loved ones through skills in analysing tasks, modifying activities, adapting the environment to minimise potential barriers and maximise strengths. Ultimately, as OTs, myself and Chloe play a pivotal role in assisting our patients to remain engaged in everyday life and assisting them to prepare for a good death. Within our roles, we aim to help patients achieve their optimum independence in activities that are important to them within their preferred place of care. Next slide, please. So as occupational therapists, um, we understand that personal growth and development is so important and can occur even in the last phase of a person's life. This means that a person's occupations can be transformational when it comes to those that are facing end of life. We can support individuals to continue and value the occupations that are meaningful to them in order for them to live 
life the way that they want to, even if they are um, facing functional decline or a terminal in illness. We pride ourselves in making sure that we remain as holistic as possible with every person that we care for. Um, and in order to do this, uh, occupational therapists will tend to look at a person's self-care, productivity and leisure. Next slide, please. So when looking at a person's self-care, we're looking at everyday aspects that you carry out in regards to your personal care, such as washing, dressing and toileting, as well as supporting you from getting from one room to the other as safely as possible. When looking at productivity, we're looking at any occupations that you do or would like to continue to be involved with. Um, this could include your job, any volunteering, um, and even down to things like your personal role, such as being a parent or a grandparent or just a general friend. Um, the leisure aspects that we carry out looks at any outdoor or indoor activities that you might do, whether you're part of a group or have any overall hobbies or personal interests that you would like to continue or even just start doing completely from scratch. Even though you might be looking at end of life planning, this doesn't mean that you have to stop or give up on the things that you love just because of your illness. Um, we're here to support you as best as we can and to help you to continue the things that you love to do. Um, the model that's shown on the slide there is the Canadian model of occupational therapy. Um, this is just one of the models that we use um, to guide our practice as OTs um, in order to stay as holistic as possible. We can also use this model to develop a patient-centred treatment plan to assist in identifying and increasing engagement and motivation in everyday activities and a person's personal care. Next slide, please. So occupational therapists can discuss what is meaningful or important to the individual on a physical, social, emotional and spiritual level. We set goals with the person living with the palliative illness around what they would like to continue doing and what they wish to achieve before they die. When exploring discharge, myself and Chloe work closely with patients, families and their carers to identify what's really important to them, what are their priorities and their wishes for the future. By exploring the strengths and barriers to discharge, we're able to establish realistic and achievable goals. Goals may be related to spending time at home with family and friends, making practical arrangements for death, or completing a particular activity, such as visiting the beach for one last time. But more typically, patients' goals are related to their everyday activities. For example, being able to maintain independence and safety when showering or bathing, or be able to safely transfer around their homes. Goals are reassessed and modified to meet the changing nature of the disease progression and the patient's physical abilities. We parallel plan alongside the medical team, and although we always hope for the best, we plan for the worst, as this will hopefully ensure a safe and sustainable discharge. Something I've learned since working for Cornwall Hospice Care is that every patient environment and social situation is very different, but will often be very complex. By being proactive and taking time to explore the situation thoroughly, it allows us to build trusting relationships with patients and their loved ones. And ultimately, we're able to achieve successful discharges which focus on what the patient really wants. Next slide, please. So in order to start looking at a plan for getting you home or to your preferred place of care, we may carry out a home visit to check that the environment is able to meet your care needs safely. We'll look at the access into the property to see whether any adaptations or support is needed to assist you in and out safely. We will also look at any areas within the property that um, you might be using daily, such as the bedroom or bathroom, or your preferred, preferred room in the house. Um, this also gives family members and carers the opportunity to express any further questions or any queries that they might have regarding discharge planning or your care. Next slide, please. So an occupational therapist will look at your preferred place of care to assess the access and any living space that you would like to be used when discharged. We will also look and see if any equipment is needed and whether it will fit and can be used safely within this environment. Equipment doesn't need to be complicated. Even everyday small items can make a positive difference to a patient. Examples of equipment could be something small like a raised toilet seat or a kitchen trolley or a bed lever to larger items such as a hospital bed or a hoist. Due to the unpredictable nature of our patients' health, our assessments are regularly reviewed and we change them as needed. Next slide, please. And um, we can also put other services in place that can support you at home. So for example, key safes, which can allow for care access into the property as and when needed. Um, lifelines can also support with safety by alerting the relevant services or family members 
if you've had a fall or if you need medical help. This can also be worn as a bracelet, a necklace or a single pendant as shown in the slide. The technical officers as well um, can come to your property to personally look at any adaptations that they'll be fitting, but they can also provide you with any advice regarding adaptations as well. We also look at wheelchairs and specialist seating that you might require for home. This can either be for a functional need or for symptom control purposes. Next slide, please. So as OTs, myself and Claire are always looking at the bigger picture and we explore with the nursing team the need for any additional support at home from its maybe a package of care, but also smaller everyday things such as social support networks, helping to arrange grocery and medication deliveries, or accessing local volunteer services such as Befenders. Next slide, please. So linking back to the main que question, which is what matters to you at discharge? Um, we have to remember that every person is completely different. Every person's environment and situation is different and what they want to achieve is different too. Um, here are some examples of some of the recent goals that we've helped people to work towards and achieve. So one memorable um, patient that we had right in the height of COVID was a much younger patient who had a significant level of nursing care needs, which meant that he would need to move to a nursing home. Now, his main and only concern with his move was, was having a 65-inch TV at the care home. Obviously, COVID restricted what we could do to help with this. So we had volunteer Cornwall um, helped us get the TV to the care, the care home for him. We do have a lot of amazing um, goals that we could talk about. There are lots and lots. Um, but the main majority of our patients... Um, their goal is really just to be as independent as possible for as long as possible, which I think is really important. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just some of the contact details for both of the hospices. Um, next slide, please. There we go. Thank you ever so much. That's fantastic. There are some comments that I wanted to do. Uh, we're a little bit um, so sorry, tight on time, but what we will do, as I've said all the way through, every question and comment will be picked up and you can, you will get all the presentations and um, as Salmon's just, uh, just shared contact details. So um, Catherine has just said she's said to the same patients who haven't had this care. Um, Sue has just said the simplest things such as a ripple bed or a high rise toilet seat can make all the difference. Um, and then uh, Ella has just said, I often find that OTs were able to facilitate wider conversations once dealt with the practicalities, which leads to end of life care planning. And I guess um, it's great you mentioned Volunteer Cornwall because I was going to say um, I, that kind of work with community makers and the community support network seems really important. But it would just be kind of great just to get some final comments from just some of those things that people have raised. Okay. Um, Volunteer Cornwall have really stepped up um, during COVID. Um, we've got a local chap called Bill. I think I've been blacklisted from his phone, but um, yeah, he's done some amazing things with us during COVID. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and do you find, Sam, that kind of those like real small touches? You mentioned the 65 inch TV and I was even just remembering my nan and the importance of if anyone served a cold tea, watch out. Um, but they're kind of really small comforts that make a difference. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this chap in particular, he's he'd had his best birthday ever whilst at the oh. hospice. So oh. that was really poignant. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for presenting. Now we'd love to spend more time talking to you. Um, but Lolly, we're after me going 15 minutes over yesterday, I'll be in trouble today. Um, so we will share everything and all of the questions straight over to you. So thank you so much um, for joining us this afternoon. Um, and now we're going to be uh, handing over um, to our next fantastic presenter. Um, hello, Mark, Reverend Mark Richards. Reverend Mark Richards is a spiritual and pastoral care and, and a voluntary at, volunteer at the Royal Cornwall Hospitals Trust for the past 11 years and loves his job, which is great to hear. He is the facilitator for the Southwest Healthcare Chaplains Collaborative and a member of the College of Healthcare Chaplains Professional Committee. 
and he is passionate about providing outstanding care at the end of life. So over to you, Mark, for the role of faith and spirituality when planning for end of life. Thank you, Nikki, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, just amazed at the previous speakers, uh, and hopefully uh, what I'm about to say will add to uh, already the richness that we've had across these last couple of days. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here this afternoon. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing with you for the next 10 minutes or so. The role of faith and spirituality when planning for the end of life, what matters to you at the end? Well, it's an enormous topic uh, for which I have only 10 minutes to cover. So I'm going to be as simple as I possibly can uh, and direct as I possibly can. And hopefully something I say will be memorable and uh, you'll remember will stick in your mind and inform your practice and uh, your professional care, uh, whatever your context. Uh, as Nikki has said, I work at the Royal Cornwall Hospitals Trust uh, and I'm passionate about end of life care and the role of faith and spirituality when planning for that uh, event and process. For me, it's central. It enables us, together with others, to do something beautiful for someone as they approach the end of their life and come to the end of their life. For me, it's about changing lives. I've seen it more times than I can probably remember over the 12 years I've been a chaplain. We're working together, respecting and remembering someone's spirituality and at times including their faith has enabled us with them to do something wonderful, memorable and beautiful at the end of life. Next slide please. Where does it begin? I've just highlighted there a little spirituality in nursing care, uh, a pocket guide that's available. Uh, there'll be a download uh, in the goodie bag at the end of the conference for you to have a look at that. Um, and it succinctly really puts together uh, what spiritual care is and what it begins to look like. Uh, next slide, please. And there we have a wonderful definition within that little booklet. In fact, we could have a whole conference on what is spirituality and spiritual care, um, but time doesn't allow for that. And this distinctly and very uh, clearly in this little booklet is, is a great help and a great aid. Spiritual care for me begins in the heart and in the head. It's a relationship between the carer and those we care for and those we care for and us as carers. For some of us, it's instinctive, it's intuitive, but for others, it may take a little bit more thought and a little bit more work. However, it's something that is essential to end of life care, something that we can all engage with because when we do it well, it makes a difference to the lives of those that we care for and work alongside. Could I have the next slide, please? For me, spiritual care that at times would involve the role of faith is incarnational. What do I mean about that? What do I mean by that? It's about working for, working with, and being with. That's kind of the way we do things in healthcare, isn't it? Even as a chaplain. But for me, I want to flip that on its head and say that spiritual and faith care at the end of life starts with being with. Seeing the person and hearing their story. I have a very close colleague who was always reminding me that every patient has their own story. As we are with people, or when we take time to be with people, that gives an opportunity for us to hear their story, for them to share their story, and for that then 
to be the foundation, the beginning of looking at the whole subject of spirituality and faith at the end of life with those that we care for. And it's about working with. It's about working in partnership. Some of the greatest lessons I've learned are from patients, a particular patient of mine that I can remember even today, whereby for 12 months and more up until uh, their death, they were not able to get out of a hospital bed. And yet when I went to be with that patient, I received just as much from that relationship as I'm sure the patient did from my visit, probably even more so. So it's about working with, working with them, working with our healthcare partners and fellow healthcare professionals and others outside of our sphere of work. We've heard about some of those this afternoon. And occasionally it will mean that we have to work on behalf of a good example of what we do as chaplains is sometimes we're called upon to have the privilege and honour of ar arranging emergency weddings. And there we hear the story of the person involved and their loved one. We try to involve their families. We work in partnership with others. And then on behalf of them, we do that which they can't do, which is to make the contact and make it possible. And you'll hear a comment about that uh, in a moment or two's time. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. This is a, a little bit of a definition that I, I've come up with, that I've played with, uh, that's not entirely mine, but um, I've claimed it from someone else and just added a little bit to it. Spiritual and pastoral care, faith at the end of life is best done without any sense of supremacy or superiority, but with bold and deep humility and a shared humanity. Can we go to the next slide, please? I'm just gonna let these comments sit with you just for a moment or two's time. Uh, these are comments that we've gathered from those that we have worked alongside. We've partnered with, we've been with and we've worked with and we've received from patients, people and their families who have said, this is how you've made me feel as I've come to the end of my life. The first comment was from a family on critical care who had lost uh, a loved one. Next slide, please. I remember this patient and I remember that look of sheer joy that lit up her face. And that all came because a healthcare assistant took the time to get to know this patient and phoned at the chaplaincy and said, I've been talking to someone over the last few weeks. I know she'd really like to see you. And again, that's working together, hearing the patient's story and providing something beautiful at the end of this person's life. Next slide, please. Just going back to the uh, example of the wedding, uh, this is our wedding box and working together with bereavement services and the palliative care team in the hospital. And of course, the registrar uh, here in Cornwall, uh, on numerous occasions, we've been able very quickly to do something life changing and life affirming for those who've requested it. Next slide, please. And again, in this situation, we enabled a family member to do something very special uh, for their mum. And I remember uh, stepping back when it was almost um, not for me to be there anymore um, because the moment it was so special between the mother and her daughter. And again, that was working with, uh, working for, uh, and it came from being with uh, in that situation. Next slide, please. 
And this is the final comment. As we've learned this afternoon, death, death, uh, end of life care, spirituality at the end of life can be something as simple as a 65 inch TV screen. I think I'd like that in uh, my room uh, if I ever found myself in that situation. And it can be something as profound as enabling oneself to be married, anything in between. And again, um, next slide, please. I love, I love this comment. Um, Maya Angelou, one of my favourite uh, poets and authors. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. People will never forget how you made them feel. And I can agree with that wholeheartedly and with great passion that when we get faith and spirituality and pastoral care as an integral part of end of life care, it enables us together with them to do something beautiful that stays with them and of course their families for years and years and years. And so uh, I want to just conclude because there's some resources um, that'll be on the slides uh, from speakers. There will be some website uh, links to some really, really good people. Um, please uh, make use of them. They'll inform your practice and your care uh, and your knowledge. But finally, I just want to say uh, Tom Hanks was interviewed by Graham Norton one uh, New Year's Eve on his programme and he said, uh, so Tom, what are your uh, New Year's resolutions? And Hank said, I have three. Be kind, be kind, be kind. And that for me is the essence of end of life care, whether it involves faith, whether it doesn't. But it's the essence and the foundation of doing something beautiful for someone at the end of life changing their world and the world of those who love them and care for them and it changes our world too and the care we're able to offer them as you can tell i could speak all afternoon about something i'm so passionate about but thank you for giving me the few minutes you've been able to give me uh, it's been a real honor privilege and a pleasure thank you Thank you so much. I think uh, you're being lined up for a future webinar already, Mark, uh, looking at Gina's comments, maybe um, so as a topic in its own right. So thank you. And I think what you said about being with and seeing and hearing people's story is so important. And sometimes perhaps, you know, in everyone's life, there are things perhaps that you've never shared with anyone and that important conversation um, that speaking with someone like yourself at such an important time just gives people that space doesn't it to find some peace mm. not something sometimes we understand I just am um, reflecting as you were talking about supporting someone as a carer and literally at the end of his life we couldn't find what it was that was going to settle he did everything we tried bringing his dog in everything and I, I asked the question of whether or not he'd ever been religious or had any kind of spirit and everyone was no and I said can we try it anyway and we brought someone in and it just left them alone together for an hour and it brought the most peace and I think you said something about you know that staying not just with that person but with that stayed with me all these years later uh, mm. I just want to pick up a couple of comments in the chat um, because as ever today we are there's so many so much brilliant information Andrea said, I'm interested to hear you talking today and um, have you based this on any research as well? Um, the methodology in mental health research um, and uh, Saski has said with bold and deep humility and shared humanity. I love that. Um, and Vicky has said, thank you. This is heartwarming and so beautiful. And just quickly, David has said, putting aside my own religious beliefs, which is essential. I know that spirituality is a significant means of support for people facing death. Um, so I don't know if you want to just make some final comments on any of that, Mark. I think 
probably to answer the first question, it's more um, qualitative sort of uh, and anecdotal and, uh, and life experience rather than based on on um, anything academic. But I will do for that the person who's asked that question, um, I will do some research and um, send them anything that I find. Um, and I thank you for all the really kind comments that have come up. And I think, you know, just finally, finally to say that um, although chaplains are uh, designated uh, and, and appointed and sort of employed to provide spiritual and pastoral care um, you know, and faith care, actually it's something that we all do. Um, and um, that's what I would encourage us, each and every one of us, wherever we are, is to just have a moment where you can hear something of the patient's story because that will just inform and transform the care you give. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's where I'll, I'll end. Thank you my so time, much. My time is up. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to hear from Ali Dickinson. Ali Dickinson is the director of End of Life Doula UK and a practicing doula based in Devon. She is trained with living well, dying well after years of working in HR and has volunteered in local hospices and works out and about in the community as a doula, raising awareness of all things death and dying related. Ali facilitates community events such as end of life planning, funeral planning, death cafes, information sessions and bereavement cafes. Uh, over to you, Ali. Do you know what I was thinking before um, I started started um, to, to, to talk is one day there may be no need to do a talk about what are end of life doulas. That would be absolutely uh, fantastic. Um, I'm just waiting for my slides to be shared, if that's OK. Sorry, Ali, give me a second. It's OK. Yeah. Carry, carry on talking. So I um, say one day there will be no need to talk about end of life doulas. I sometimes wonder as well if um, at events we are almost talking to the converted already. Um, there's so many people, I think, out there that, that don't know what doulas do. Um, but just to talk about that, the word doula is of Greek origin. Sorry, thank you. Next slide, thank you. So of Greek, Greek, Greek origin, and it literally means a, a woman of, of, of service. Um, but it's not a new concept in any way at all. Um, back in the day, um, the role was probably traditionally performed by women. Um, and uh, women in the working in their own communities long before people's dying was supported by national organizations nhs hospices etc um we're not medical um we come from a range of backgrounds so um within our community practice we do have people who have uh, been nurses, uh, GPs, uh, we have people that have been town planners, solicitors, we have people that have worked in the house um, rather than in outside organisations. So we come from a whole range of backgrounds. Um, but I think what's important to us as a community of practice is that we are focusing very much on our, our diversity. And we do, as I say, have people from a range of different backgrounds, a range of different cultures and ethnicities, um, but we could do better. So um, I think we want less people or people overwhelmed that are not looking like me. So women of a certain age, gray hair, white. Um, and I think that's very, very important for our way forward and why we're focusing is that we don't want to talk about our movement being um, hard to reach. We want to talk about it being easy to identify with and people to know that that we, we were there. So uh, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, death is feared and to some extent it's become institutionalised over recent decades. Um, so death and dying taking place in hospitals, hospices, um, the dead handed over to, to funeral directors. 
and the skills which were common in our communities have have been have been lost and I think an important part of the doula role is to reinstate this innate knowing that we all have about death and dying and how to be with the people we love and care for them at at end of life and again um, another dream is that I would love to say that one day the role of doula is no longer needed um, because we are that bridge um, where we are reinstating that knowledge in our, our communities and we will have achieved that job and people will have that, that knowledge and knowing and be able to be alongside um, the, the, the people they, care, they love and want to care for. So uh, I think during COVID, it's become very apparent that um, health and social care systems are overstretched and underfunded. So again, people realising that they need to be equipped to look after their own. And the doula role is to be alongside those communities, alongside those individuals, to give them the confidence, to give them the practical support to care for their own. And I think many people have heard of birth doulas, and so we often say that uh, end of life doulas are at the other end of life. Um, so we, we the doulas are the book ends of life at the beginning and at the very end. Next slide, please. Thank you. So just to talk about our, our credibility, because there's a lot of people out there doing brilliant, brilliant work um, of a non-medical nature, either as volunteers or being paid, and they may be called end of life doulas, they may be called death doulas, they may be called uh, death midwives. Um, but we, um, are uh, end of life doula UK, are a community of practice. Um, and to just establish our credibility, our ambassador is a, a, a guy called Professor Alan Kelleher, who I think people may, some people here may know of, that he has spearheaded the Compassionate Communities Movement and has been really advocating this approach for years and years and years. And it's beautiful to see that that has now gained quite a lot of, of, of movement and is, is, is happening. Um, our patrons, and I just noticed a typo there, which is terrible. I'm really sorry about that. Our patrons are Catherine Mannix, Dr. Catherine Mannix, who wrote a book called With the End of Mind, which people have already talked about. I think Claire referred to Catherine Mannix. Um, it is a book talking about dying in very um, normal, gentle, non-medical medical terms. And our other patron is Greg Wise. So Greg Wise, um, to be sexist, is the husband of Dame Emma Thompson, but in his own right, he's a director, he's an actor, and he's written a beautiful book called Not That Kind of Love, because Greg looked after and cared for his sister at home in the last months of her life. So his sister Claire starts off writing the book about a terminal illness, and then when she becomes unwell, Greg takes over and carries on the stories um, and talks about what happens on her death and, and afterwards. So um, everybody in End of Life Dooley UK um, will have gone through the Living Well, Dying Well training. So Living Well, Dying Well is our sister organisation, but it's very much the training arm of, um, of, of, of what we do. And then as people come into practice, they're held by End of Life Doula UK and we're a membership body and we're a community interest company as well. Um, and we hold all our doulas who are practicing or supporting people, we, we, we hold them with a code of practice, um, they're DBS chat, they're insured and they're mentored. Um, so uh, that's really, really important that we're keeping ourselves safe as practicing doulas, but more importantly, we're keeping the people that we're supporting safe um, as, as well. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. So uh, it's really interesting that when I, I first started doing the training for this, this, this work, and I say I was an HR director by background, um, and I would say that people are much happier um, seeing an end-of-life doula coming into their house or home than ever seeing an HR director walking into an office, because normally that meant rubbish news like redundancies, etc. Um, but when I first started doing the training, I did have rose-tinted spectacles that somehow um, the role would be about 
sitting alongside somebody um, in the very last days of their life, holding their hands, um, playing beautiful music, burning lovely smells. And OK, that is an element of our, our, our role, but it's so much more, so much more complex than, than that. Um, so just to say that we work in people's homes normally, but we also do work in hospices. So we collaborate with hospices. We will work in care homes where we're able and we work sometimes in, in hospitals, but the norm is in the person's home. And um, we will guide people through all the decisions and choices that need to be made at end of, at end of life. Um, we act as a point of contact um, for that individual because so much can go, be going on around that person when they're dying. There can be carers, there's family visiting, there's friends visiting, um, there's doctors, there's nurses, etc, etc. So we can just be that point of contact to try and streamline things and make things orderly and, and calm. We're also there to navigate through the health and social care systems. So for a person with a life limiting illness, it can be a bit of a, a, a wilderness, it can be a bit bewildering. So we can advocate and be there to see people through the systems. We provide hands-on personal care, many of us do that. We do very the very practical. Um, so we'll push the vacuum round, we'll do housework, we'll prepare meals, we'll walk the dog, um, and we'll also help with um, domestic admin, paying the bills, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then moving away from the practical, we're there to take time to sit with the dying person and um, to use a bit of jargon, really hold that space. So to have conversations with the individual and the people they love um, about their hopes, their fears, their concerns, what's really important for them so that death, wherever possible, is approached without fear and loneliness. Um, we're there for everybody uh, in that person's network. Um, so for the person that's end of life and for the per people that are close to them. And we're there before and after death as well. Next slide, please. Um, and I think Claire just really made um, advanced planning for end of life uh, come alive as to, to what that means and, and what it looks like. Um, and we work with people um, to plan for end of life at any stage of their life. Um, so they may not have um, any health issues or there may be some um, underlying medical conditions. And we approach planning for end of life in a very um, holistic way. And these are all the elements of um, planning for end of life that we would talk to somebody about. So we would talk about refusals of treatment. We would talk about their advanced statement, their statement of wishes and preferences. Um, we'd talk about what they want to do um, regarding organ tissue donation. We can be alongside them to help them uh, do their lasting power of attorney, either online or to uh, refer to a solicitor. We talk about what people want for their funerals. Um, we can direct them to get their will done. And also we'll be alongside to help somebody um, do their digital legacy, which is basically what is their online presence in terms of any accounts they may hold, online shopping, social media, so that there isn't all the fag after somebody has died of, of just trying to, somebody else trying to access accounts. So that is what an advanced plan um, would look like for, for us if we are supporting somebody at end of life. And what I just want to follow up on is, as Claire said, this is so much about the relationship and the conversation. Um, it's not about the form. It's not going in and saying, right, you know, we're going to do your ADRT now. These are the circumstances, tick, tick, tick. We have a conversation. We establish a relationship. We try as hard as we can to understand that person and the life they have lived and the life that they want to continue living until they until they die and effectively people will do a download to us by way of a conversation and that may take take place over weeks over a number of hours and we find that um, by having that conversation we can get enough information to 
write up a plan for that individual and bat it backwards and forwards to them um, until it reflects what they want. So it may sound slightly counterintuitive, um, but by having those conversations, really listening very hard, um, and then those conversations actually going somebody somewhere, we will go away and, and write that up for the individual. Uh, next slide, please. So just to say, during the pandemic, um, we have been working with people face to face, um, but also we've realised the need for a 24-7 free um, one sort of person by volunteers uh, do the support line so that people can reach us out to us by telephone at any time of uh, the night and day and I think that's really important that when people want to um, talk they want to talk almost there and then you know not necessarily just between office hours so uh, we've had conversations with people that are terminally uh, ill. Um, we've had conversations with people that may have been delivered a really rotten, rotten diagnosis by a consultant or a doctor, and then they're left by telephone, they're left holding that, that information. Um, we may be talking to um, adult children who are caring for a, a, a parent who's dying at home. We've done um, remotely advanced planning um, um, through Zoom. We've talked to people who may be experiencing death anxiety or anticipatory grief or those that have been bereaved. And so a lot of the conversations have been with people just about the fear of becoming serious, seriously ill or who may be struggling with um, social, social distancing. Next slide, please. And um, part of our role, I think they said in the introduction that we do work very much in our, our communities. Um, so as well as doing one on one doula support, we host death cafes, um, as others do, we run workshops on advanced planning, on how to care for a body when somebody's died, on all sorts of topics relating to death and dying. We've also increasingly during the panic pandemic piggybacked onto other community and voluntary groups. So those voluntary groups may be doing um, shopping for people in their communities or just um, looking out for people who are living alone. And then we've provided the end of life um, element support guidance on the, on the back of those voluntary groups. And um, during non-pandemic times as well, we will run festival and events um, to during, particularly during Dying Matters, Dying Matters Week. So we are very much based in our communities as individuals, uh, in, as doulas. Next slide, please. Right, so this is, I've rattled through that pretty quickly, I think. Um, uh, this is uh, an email address if anybody wants to be in touch with us. Um, they can contact me um, because I'm at, at the centre, uh, secretary at eol-doula.uk. I'm really sorry that Facebook address is absolute rubbish. Um, it isn't that it isn't that handle at all. If you Google End of Life Doula UK, I'll try and put it up in the chat, Facebook, then you'll find our Facebook page. And we try to put all sorts of information on that Facebook page. So it, it, it's pretty it's pretty random and it's pretty diverse. So there's interesting things on there. There's fun things on there. Just just bits and pieces of information. We're on Twitter if you want to follow us on Twitter, and we have a website as well. Um, so that's the the website address. So um, that's me done. Oh, thank you oh, so thank much, you for so much that, Ali. That, Amazing Ali. information. People are commenting that um, didn't know that doulas were there, uh, uh, but we've also had just a couple. One question I'd like to pick up. Um, we will absolutely, um, as with all the presentations, share all the answers to the questions and and all the other contact them directly. Are doulas county wide, Ali? Thank you. Yeah, so I, that wasn't in there. We're throughout the UK, so we're we're not big, 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 but um, there's about 230 of us spread throughout the UK. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, someone who's saying they'd actually like to become a doula. Um, <laughs> and also just um, Diane just saying, where would you go to find a doula? I work in the community. So I guess um, you would say, I don't want to speak for you, to, to kind of visit your website and or to Thank contact you, you yeah. directly. 
there's a contact form on there. Um, so that does sound a little bit distant, doesn't it? But as soon as we get the contact form, somebody gets in touch very, very quickly. So you get human contact very quickly. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much um, for your time today. And what an amazing role that you play, as you said, kind of reconnecting communities with that end of life experience. And, you know, in Cornwall, we also see so many people from an elderly population that are alone because friends and family may be away, not able to spend that time. Um, and so thinking that um, how reassuring that is to have someone alongside you on those journeys for some of the people um, that we see in our community. So thank you very much um, for your presentation. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, so now we're going to um, hear from Lucy, changing the public conversation around death and loss with the Good Grief Festival. Lucy is the founding director of the Good Grief Festival and senior research fellow in the School of Population Health Sciences, University of Bristol. Her research and publications over the past 15 years have mainly focused on psychosocial and spiritual aspects of the illness experience, decision making and communication, family caregiving and bereavement and widening access to services. Over to you, Lucy. Thank you so much, Nikki, and thank you all for inviting me today. Uh, I'm going to try to share my presentation now from my side, so just bear with me. OK, I hope you can all see that. I can't now see you, um, but I hope that that works for you all. Um, so as Nikki said, I work as a researcher at the University of Bristol um, and last year I founded a festival called Good Grief. It was a couple of years in the making um, and I'm going to talk about the festival today. But before I start, can I just um, again thank the organisers so much for this really amazing seminar and thank the previous speakers too. So I've really enjoyed tuning in today um, and thank you, Ali, for enlightening me a bit more about end of life doulas. I really appreciated that. Um, and the title of my presentation is Changing the Public Conversation Around Death and Loss. So what I'm planning to speak about is, first of all, the background to the festival. So for some people, I'm sure that doesn't include you guys, but for some people would think, why a grief festival? Um, it can, you know, those two words, grief and festival, don't necessarily go together in everyone's minds. Um, and then talk about what we originally planned, because this, this was something that um, originated before the pandemic, and then what we actually created in the end, um, how it went, um, so a little bit of our engagement and evaluation data, um, and then finally how you can still get involved and, and what we're planning for the future. So I can't really talk about the festival um, without talking about my daughter. So my, my second daughter, Ada, was sadly stillborn on the 13th of April um, 2018, and you can see her memory box there. Um, and it was really this very pro profound loss um, and the grief and that went along with that, which, um, yeah, it, it really made me realise, I think, you know, I'd studied grief and bereavement and end of life and palliative care for many years before this happened to me. But it was only really that really personal experience that showed me and reminded me of the power of grief and the fact that it does just change your life so much. It's so transformative, especially a sudden death. Um, and yet it's not really spoken about in those terms. And I think if you haven't had that experience of bereavement, you wouldn't necessarily know that it can be that transformative. Um, and this is, you know, it was obviously a difficult experience for me at the time, but I wasn't, you know, in that 10% of people that needed specialist mental health support or anything like that. It was from, in many ways, um, you know, a, an everyday kind of bereavement. This happens all the time. And yet it really showed me the importance of talking about grief more openly. And as a society that we still had some way to go in terms of how we support and respond to people who've been bereaved. And I really love this quote by Nick Cave, who just highlights the universality of grief. So it seems to me that if we love, we grieve. That's the deal, that's the pact. Grief and love are forever intertwined. Grief is a terrible reminder of the depths of our love. And like love, grief is non-negotiable. There's a vastness to grief that overwhelms our minuscule selves. So grief is universal and yet it continues to be something that we're not that brilliant at dealing with and responding to. So 
In 2019, the Sue Ryder charity published a report called A Better Grief, which some of you may be familiar with. And over half of respondents to this national survey reported they were scared of saying the wrong thing to a bereaved person. One in two said they didn't know what support to offer. And one in four actually said they would avoid talking to somebody about their bereavement. And these um, you know, attitudes were worse among younger people, which perhaps isn't surprising. You know, it's a, it can be a scary thing to respond to um, and deal with. Um, but also in the Southwest, it was also slightly worse compared to the national average, which I thought was interesting. And these kind of social attitudes can really make um, the isolation and loneliness that can go along with grief worse. Um, so only 25% of people say that they feel supported following a death. So we know that from research is a little old now. Um, and less than 10% access professional support. Now, it might not be that, you know, we don't know the exact numbers of people who would benefit from professional support, but we do know that there are um, barriers around access to bereavement support, just as there are barriers around access to end of life care and palliative care. And a key barrier is feeling uncomfortable asking for help. And this is more common among younger people and those from more socioeconomically disadvantaged backgrounds. And bereavement itself, of course, is also associated with risks to mental health and morbidity, so health problems, um, mortality and additional so socioeconomic costs, for example, from people being unable to work. So the aims for Good Grief um, were to provide ways to talk, think, learn about and share experiences of grief to widen access to research in grief and bereavement, so to take academic research out of the university and actually um, you know, share it with people for whom it really matters, widen access to bereavement services, so overcoming some of those barriers. And we were particularly interested to focus on disadvantaged young people and people from black and minority ethnic communities who we know access bereavement services less. Um, and also to help forge a compassionate community. And this is something that's come up in a few of the presentations this afternoon. And, and Ali just mentioned um, the idea that actually, you know, can we, through having a festival like Good Grief, try and contribute towards a shift in our social attitudes and in our public conversation around death and grief um, in the UK? So, as I said, this is a pre-pandemic initiative. So what we actually planned was working with a big network of partners across Bristol. Um, we got the funding from the Wellcome Trust to run Good Grief Bristol, which was a citywide festival integrating the arts and the sciences, um, which we refined through community consultation. So we did a lot of extensive consultation to actually design the content and the format of the festival. And it was due to take place um, across Dying Matters Week last year. The festival itself had three main components. So we had our kind of core events, so kind of key speakers, workshops, um, activities, and a conference at the university as well. So we were mainly using a venue at the university and then um, Bristol Beacon, which is a, a major um, venue that many of you probably know in Bristol. Um, and then we had a series of partner events. So these were organized by and with our local partners. So um, events at Arnest Vale, at, uh, we're planning a film series at Watershed Cinema, um, a collaboration with Creative Youth Network and Bristol Museum and Art Gallery, to name just a few. And then our third component um, was the community event. So we set up a small grant scheme for local organisations. And this was really to reach the festival out of the centre of Bristol and make sure we were um, engaging people in, in more deprived areas of Bristol. And we had a really great response to that. We had around, um, I think it was 23 events planned across the whole of the Bristol area. So, you know, including Sill Sea Mills, St Paul's, um, Barton Hill, kind of, you know, across Bristol. So that was what we planned. One aspect of it we did manage to do before the pandemic struck. So um, we had a collaboration with Creative Youth Network, which is a really brilliant youth organisation that works with young people between the ages of 10 and 18 from across Bristol and South Gloucestershire. Um, and they often come from more disadvantaged backgrounds. And in their spring term last year, they ran nine kind of creative courses and they used the theme of grief for those courses. Um, so there were 90 sessions, 180 hours. 
um, and they worked with 76 young people and we also ran a film workshop in um, the half term in February for five young bereaved people and made a short film with them um, and if you go to that website there and um, you'll get these slides afterwards but the Creative Youth Network um, has got a, a showcase um, of everything that was created during those creative sessions and I think they're just I was so impressed um, you know there's a whole range of different things from you know, printmaking, um, drawing, films, animation, um, all sorts. So, you know, I do recommend taking a look at that. And then, of course, there was COVID-19 that came along. So at the time um, of, you know, the approach of COVID-19, we were in the process of, um, you know, registration was open. We were selling tickets to the events. We'd done all the programming and you know, everything was kind of um, fully underway. Um, and then it came, you know, I think by the beginning of March, uh, it became really clear, actually, you know, we need to make a decision now and, you know, decide to cancel the event or postpone the event. So so we did go ahead and do that. Um, and then, you know, my own research has, has become much more focused on bereavement during COVID-19. And I think what became clear very quickly was that there was actually even more need for the festival. So, you know, we've been faced, um, you know, the whole of the human race has been faced with a mass bereavement event um, and that's obviously played out in, in really tragic ways in the UK so we've had you know over 128,000 deaths in the UK um, and this is in addition to you know around um, half a million to 600,000 deaths which we experience every year in the UK and everyone bereaved in the UK of regardless of cause is obviously and been experiencing their bereavement in really challenging circumstances of, of social isolation, of all the restrictions that have been in place, of difficult experiences of end of life care often. Um, and there's a, an interesting paper by Verdery and colleagues from the States, which suggests that each person that's bereaved, sorry, for each death, about nine people are bereaved. And if that's the case, you know, we're looking at in the UK, you know, 5.6 to 6.5 million people um, being bereaved in these really challenging circumstances um, of, of the pandemic. And so we then set about, you know, after kind of taking a bit of a break and trying to recover from the huge impact of having to, to cancel the festival, which we all felt so passionately about, um, we thought, OK, you know, we need to move this online. Um, and I think that was actually, you know, it, it meant we couldn't do certain things that I was I was really committed to and really wanted to do, like the community events. Um, and we had we did lose some money in the course of, of having to change in that way. But actually, um, the response to running it online was really um, incredible, and we were able to reach far more people doing it online than we would have done we would have if it had run as a live event in Bristol. So, how did we transform Good Grief? So. It became a free festival, um, so we were um, selling tickets. I mean, they they weren't very expensive tickets at all, um, and there were some free events anyway um, in the original plan for Good Grief. But um, I just thought it's not appropriate to be selling tickets at this time. Um, so we made it a free festival. It ran in October. Um, we also then, alongside it, we set up the Grief Channel, um, which has become a sort of portal for all our events, all our Good Grief events. Um, we were then in January approached by Marie Curie um, to run their online events for the day of reflection that they kind of spearheaded on the 23rd of March. Um, and we also then decided to run a second Good, Good Reef Festival the weekend after the day of reflection, so the 27th and 28th of March. Um, and then in addition to that, it's taken on a bit of a life of its own. Um, and we're also running some ongoing events with Julia Samuel. Um, we've run some events with Gary Andrews and we've got some more coming up um, over the next few months. Um, and all of these events are free. Um, and then all the content from both festivals and these ongoing events is available on the on the Grief channel, um, which is £20 to sign up to for the year. And um, so you can see the two, two websites there. Um, and so what did we change? Well, we made it free we also decided to make it shorter so we had planned a whole week of events um, and we turned it into three days um, we couldn't run the community events anymore obviously given all the restrictions in place 
Um, we went for shorter sessions um, and we tried to make it interactive. It is difficult when, when you're doing online events, but certainly in the, in the October event where we had a little bit more time for planning and things, we did have some kind of interactive workshops, um, which worked really well and were really popular. Um, we had fewer kind of longer lectures and more panel discussions. And we also had some events which were pre-recorded and that was kind of essential really because as you can imagine, kind of doing three days of purely live um, events can be a bit um, a bit challenging and slightly stressful. <laughs> it's like doing a kind of live TV show for three days. Um, so we ran it online, but we did have a sort of pop up studio in Bristol in a in a kind of very small kind of warehouse in an industrial area in Bristol, um, and we had live facilitators, and then we linked those to people um who joined kind of remotely so a sort of mixture of, of kind of in studio and and joining people remotely from home um, there was a lot of contingency planning so you can imagine we were constantly looking at the rules and trying to work out what we could do um, but thankfully we the, the time we ran the first festival was just before the lockdown in november and um, so we it, we were quite lucky because we got it within that window we had sort of two stages um, to the festival, so a main stage and then a workshops and webinars kind of room. Um, and we brought in some new national partners, um, Cruise Bereavement Care and the Good Grief Trust both collaborated with us, which was fantastic. So this was um, the structure and this is focused on the October festival. The March festival was a more pared down um, version, so we didn't have quite as much um, as much going on. Um, so we had talks and interviews on the main stage. Um, we had speakers like Catherine Mannix, who've been mentioned, Rachel Clark, um, Alice Roberts, Robert Webb, the comedian, and Carrie Ad Lloyd. They all did sessions, some pre-recorded sessions um, with Ka Carrie Ad did, and Valentine Warner, the chef, and Julia Samuel, um, who's been a huge supporter of the festival has been, and is just brilliant in how she talks about grief, I think. Um, then we had our workshops and webinars. So these were the more, uh, the sort of, more interactive, smaller audience type events. Um, so we had sessions on designing meaningful funerals, we had death cafe, we had kind of writing as a form of memorialization, oh, sorry, writing a memoir. Um, and then we also had writing as um, journaling as part of the grieving process. Um, and then we had webinars on grief in film, grief in literature, grief in philosophy. Um, and then we had the grief school and the grief chat. So the idea for the grief school was that we would provide information about different types of um, bereavement, but we would also crucially have in those sessions people with lived experience of the bereavement and um, a therapist or an academic with some you know, background knowledge of that topic as well. Um, and they worked really well, I think. Um, we covered a whole range of different topics and all of those are still um, available on the on the grief channel now. Um, and they were all um, pre-recorded events, so they were repeated on a loop throughout the festival. And then our final kind of type of events were called grief chats. And these were conversations between two people who had experienced the same kind of bereavement. Um, and they were facilitated by um, Mark Lemon who's a writer and broadcaster who, who talks a lot about his own experiences of grief. And again, those were pre-recorded and, and repeated on a loop. So those were some of our um, speakers from the first festival. Um, and then just to give you a, sort of some of the highlights from the second festival, um, which I won't go into, but we had some, yeah, we had some really great sessions as well with um, Michael Rosen and Julia Samuel, Governor B was really brilliant as well, talking about his experiences of his father's death um, Catherine May talking about the power of rest and retreat, which seemed especially kind of poignant and important in the context of the pandemic. Um, and as you can see, we had a host of other people as well joining us. So since October, um, we've had around 15,000 people view the festival content, which um, it's, I, I, I kind of I think it's it's hard with these big numbers, isn't it? Because you you don't really take them in, and then every now and now and again, I think, wow, you know, last September, um, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen, um, and actually, you know, it's been really amazing to see the thirst for kind of content around grief and bereavement. I think there's a real um, public interest in this area, and I think you know at the beginning when I when I say like. Oh, this idea for a grief festival to people I could see them kind of thinking hmm not sure about that but actually I think what we've what we've really found is that um 
the opportunity to have sort of authentic connection and share experiences and, and learn about grief and bereavement uh, in a way which is, you know, engaged with arts and engaged with literature and presented in a way which is not, um, you know, completely in your face. Um, it, it's yeah, I think we've just we've just found that actually there is a real interest in it. There is a real thirst for it. Um, we've had quite a few people sign up to the Grief Channel, which has been great. Um, and it's really the money through the Grief Channel subscriptions, which allows us to run the events for free. Um, so we're a non-profit and we just kind of plough any money that we get back into the kind of ongoing events. Um, and we've also got CPD points for doctors by the Grief Channel as well. Um, so that's via the Royal College of Physicians. We've got 20 CPD points. We've had really brilliant engagement, and this I think is the most um, the most kind of impactful and moving thing for me has been to see the engagement with the kind of online chat alongside the events, and also on social media. And we have a community blackboard, just seeing people sharing experiences, supporting each other, um, signposting to additional resources, and that kind of thing. Um, here are just some comments from from social media. Um, it's quite yeah, I mean it's. It's kind of almost quite overwhelming sometimes to kind of see people's feedback and engagement with it and it sort of makes it all worthwhile because we are a really small team um and yeah we work really hard because I think all of us have got experience of, of grief and bereavement and we really believe that it is something um yeah that it's an important thing to kind of get out there this is our community blackboard which is just a tab on the website where people can um, add comments and communicate with each other we had some really good um, media coverage, um, I think, because of the context of the pandemic. Again, we probably wouldn't have got such um, media coverage without um, yeah, the combination of the pandemic and then the research project that I've been leading um, with Emily Harrop at Cardiff University on bereavement during the pandemic as well. And the two, the study and the festival have kind of, you know, fed into each other and gone alongside. So I wanted to give you a little bit of um, yeah, I'm a researcher, so I find it interesting. Um, a little bit of the data from the evaluations we've run. So we do um, surveys before and after the festivals. I'm going to just um, focus on the, the post-festival surveys here. Um, so after the first festival, we had 689 people respond and give feedback, and the second one, um, 543. We also ask um, two free text questions. So please tell us your suggestions for how the festival could have been improved. And is there anything else you'd like to say about the festival? And then we also worked with an independent researcher who conducted four online focus groups in November last year. And these were with four um, different groups of festival attendees. So there were people that had come along to the festival and it was really to find out more about their experiences and get feedback from them about how we could encourage more people um, from those particular population groups to come along. So we focused on older people, younger people, people from black and minority ethnic communities and men, um, partly because as you'll see, we had far fewer men attend than women. Um, we used data from the first festival evaluation to inform the second festival. Um, and I'm writing this up for, for publication. Well, I should be writing up. I'll probably write it up in the summer, I think. So what do we know about who comes along um, to the festival? So, as I said, it's more popular with women. Um, it's hard to know the exact numbers of you know, the audience and how, how the gender split is in the audience. But in terms of the people who complete the evaluation survey, around 90 percent are women. Um, so a really, yeah, very striking there. Um, about 10 percent of our audience are from black and minority ethnic communities. Um, and this increased by about 2% from the first to the second festival. And I was really pleased. I would love, yeah, I would like, I'd love there to be, um, you know, an even more diverse audience, but we worked really, really hard and paid a lot of attention to the content of the sessions and also the diversity of our speakers and facilitators. Um, you know, if people don't see people who look like them and speak like them and talk about things that they're interested in and that kind of chime with their own interests, then there's no reason for them to come along. So um, similarly with younger people, um, it's been harder to engage younger people. We had about 15 percent of the audience from under the age of 34 um, and it would be great to reach out to more younger people. So in the second festival and in forthcoming festivals, we're going to continue to work with a number of kind of young people ambassadors that we've got on board. 
The proportion of people in the older age group, um, so age 65 plus, increased from about 20% in the October festival to 25% in March. Um, over half of the people who attend Good Grief are members of the public. 77% attend to learn about grief and bereavement, 52% to be inspired, 49% to feel part of a like-minded community. Um, oh, just to say, so, you know, half of the people attending were members of the public. I think the other categories were things like bereavement counsellor or clinician, um, uh, academic, doing research in the sub subject, teachers, um, but a, a real mix. And of course, everyone is a member of the public as well. Um, but I think it's just important to know that we're not just reaching people who are already in this field, which I think is important. Um, I think a lot of bereavement counsellors have really appreciated the resources um, and the opportunity to kind of attend some of the sessions, especially with, you know, psychologists and, and academics. Um, but a lot of the people who attend, attend, you know, because they've been bereaved. So 94% of the people um, who came along had experienced a bereavement at some point and about a third within the last year. Um, and about 10% of the people um, attending come from outside the UK. So this is obviously very pleasing as a researcher. So 89% rated the festival excellent or very good, which was brilliant. Um, and in the second festival, we actually managed to get that slightly higher to 92%, um, which is obviously just really heartwarming. You know, I, yeah, when I came up with the idea for this festival initially, and then subsequently do that, you know, we developed it hugely with a, with a big group of collaborators. Um, I just, I didn't really, you know, it wasn't really about kind of, I didn't really think, oh, the most important thing is that people think it's really great. You know, the, the crucial thing for me was the most important thing is that people get some sense of solace. Um, they get some information which is empowering um, and other people will think, oh, now I understand a little bit more. Maybe next time I won't be scared to, you know, to, to say something. Um, a higher rating of experience was associated with a greater number of festival events. Um, and over three quarters agreed or strongly agreed with the statement through attending the festival, I feel more confident talking about grief, um, which is, yeah, which is, yeah, I'm very pleased about. Um, and a higher num number of festival events is associated with a higher level of agreement with that um, statement. Some of the positive feedback that we've got. Um, I think, you know, people appreciate different things, um, but as I said, I think the community aspect in the time of COVID has been really important. So that kind of meaningful, authentic contact, sharing, um, making you feel more connected to other people and not as isolated um, at home, um, you know, in your grief um, has been, yeah, really important, I think. So how can you get involved? Um, please have a look at the Grief Channel um, if you're not already familiar with it. So you can search for different content by um, different subjects. We're still in the process of moving a lot of the March. Um, well, all the March events are on there, but not all of them have been categorised according to the different headings. So um, but you can explore and, and kind of, you know, browse what we've got there as well. Um, there are block subscriptions as well. Um, so we have had some hospices and other organisations who've bought block, block subscriptions for their volunteers and things like that. So we do offer a 20% discount for that. Um, and if you have any ideas or suggestions um, for, for Good Grief Fest, maybe you've come along and there was something you thought could have been better, or maybe you have an idea for a, a session title or a facilitator, then you know, please let us know. Or if you'd like to volunteer yourself, you know, please let, let us know. Um, and thank you all for all your support. In terms of our future plans, um, we're going to be developing the content and the format um, more to, to really try and maximise the reach and usefulness of, of what we're doing. We have some events planned for uh, May and for um, over the summer with Julia Samuel, um, Louise Winter and Anna Lyons, who, who many of you will probably know from Life, Death, whatever. Um, uh, David Kessler, who's a, a grief therapist from the States, is also doing an event on the 25th of May. Um, and you can join our mailing list or social media for updates of those events. Um, and you can also sign up via our web website. We're going to be revamping our websites, both the, um, the, the Good, Good Grief website and also the Grief Channel website. Um, so they do need a little bit of work to, to kind of bring them up to the next level, I think. 
And our longer term ambitions are really to support the compassionate communities approach to palliative and end of life care and supporting um, bereaved people, which Ali mentioned um, has been spearheaded by Alan Kelleher and Julian Abel and others in the UK. Um, and as part of this, to really support kind of what matters most initiatives as well. So the theme of, of the last two days is, is very close to my heart and I think really important. And we want to offer Good Grief as a platform for trying to um, support and encourage people to think about and talk about um, what they would like towards the end of life and, and possibly you know, document that as well. Um, I've been working with the End of Life Care Partners Think Tank, which is um, an initiative started by the Royal College of General Practitioners. And we developed and launched last year um, two videos on What Matters um, conversations. Um, there's one directed at the public called What Matters to Me, and there's another one directed at um, professionals. And if you go to the, we the website at whatmattersconversations.org, you can um, take a look at those and, you know, any work you can you know any networking suggestions and dissemination of those um videos would be really appreciated as well so that we can yeah try, try and help get the word out really um and you know from my perspective we want good grief to contribute towards a national shift in public attitudes and knowledge about um, death and dying and grief and bereavement and actually in the context of the pandemic and the number of people who have died i do think that you know, if there's one kind of silver lining, it could be a change in those, some of those public attitudes and the way that people um, talk and think about the relevance of grief and how they respond to others who, who've been bereaved and think about their own deaths. And actually, that would be a really nice um, tribute and, you know, a fitting legacy for all of the, you know, really tragic deaths that we've had since the beginning of the pandemic in the UK. So um, there are social media tags. I'd um, just like to thank all of um, our funders and also um, the very, very many um, local and regional and national collaborators that have worked on Good Grief. So thank you all very much. Well, thank you, Lucy. And um, lots of thanks to you in the chat about sharing your personal story and, in, as a, and that using that as an inspiration to create such a national shift um, and in my time I've been fortunate to work with people in different spheres and mums that have lost perhaps youth to violence who have created amazing national projects and I think what you're talking about I'm, I know there's Living Well with Pain which is another national type festival that outward facing let's have a conversation with compassionate communities just so important I can see a lot of um, people saying it to be in touch and you know how we can all become involved so thank you so much and we would I'd love to spend a little bit more time talking to you about your presentation um, but I know we can all get in touch with you directly so thank you so much for joining us today thank you thanks so much for inviting me thank you um, and it only really remains for me to say um, Thank you so much to everybody for joining over the last couple of days. Um, thank you for all of the comments in the chat. Please feedback uh, to us and how we can improve on our seminars and ideas for the future. Thank you to all our amazing presenters over the last couple of days to um, the community uh, hospice team uh, down there in Cornwall that absolutely I mean the work that goes into creating it um, and just that energy and enthusiasm it's always an absolute honour to chair these events um, so thank you you will receive all of the information links to the presentation and the CPD certificates will all be available to you um, and as we've said all the way along if you have any questions for any of the presenters about the mind-blowing amazing uh, pieces of work that are going on then please you know get in touch and thank you very much have a great rest of Thursday and Friday and weekend thanks everyone thank, thank you. you bye 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 thanks bye